Hey everyone, it's time for a little R&R. &R. No, I'm not talking about rest and relaxation, but restoration and relationships. I'm Shay Owens and I'm restoring lives and relationships through the power of coaching. Our guest today is the beautiful Rhonda Baker Sansbury. She will share, share with us a little bit of history that most of us have never even heard about. It's called the numbers or the Belita. I have my guests with me, my co-host, Mario Choice and Cortina Jackson. How you doing, good people? Wonderful to see everyone. Hey, hey. <laughs> Ms. Rhonda, tell us a little bit about, just give, give us a little bit of history about the, AKA, the lottery. Okay, this game actually started out in China. It was once called Kino, but when it moved to Cuba, it was called Bolita. Bolita in Spanish means little ball. And that's where the lottery comes from. And that's where it started. And that's bo Bolita. That's how I pronounce it, Bolita. 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 That sounds like uh, somebody I went to school with in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Spanish. No. <laughs> it's Spanish. Bolita, Bolita over there tripping, y'all. She tripping. But anyway, uh, I, I know also, too, that, you know, when this lottery was going on, it was like the peak of the Negro League, uh, Negro Baseball League. And your father was also a part of that. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, my father actually was a part of the Negro uh, baseball team. He played with the Kansas City Monarchs for a period of time. Um, but my father had something called vitiligo. Uh, my father was actually drafted to play with the Pittsburgh Pirates. But because of vitiligo, um, he was unable to participate. The team doctor would not release him to play pro ball. Um, if you know anything about vitiligo, what it is, is it's depigmentation of the skin. Basically, you have no color. It's a vitamin D deficiency. So, so he had no, so pig, no pigmentation in his skin, so he was unable to bear the sun and play pro ball. Yeah, and as we all know, baseball is at the peak of the spring and summer and fall season where the sun is just out and bright. And so it, you told me that he didn't get, did he get to play with Josh Gibson, some of those greats like you know, those guys were just a little older than my father. He he came after them. Okay. Okay. Because I know those were greats and uh they were they were like at the at the at the pinnacle of the game. A lot of them could have played in the major leagues, but because of Oh definitely. Those guys were awesome, awesome ball players. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. So talk a little bit about your dad. Like, who was he? Who was who were who was little Rhonda to daddy? Oh, I was my daddy's little princess. I was the firstborn, born in the late fifties, and I was my daddy's baby. You know, I was the only child for ten years. Wow. But tell us what that was like. You know, with you being. Um, the only child for 10 years and then your dad being a part of the Negro Baseball League and he's also a part of the numbers or the Belita. Um, well, well, once my father stopped uh, playing baseball, this is Jacksonville, Florida, the deep south, you know, and my father was unable to get a job, you know, a good paying job and he was offered an opportunity with a gentleman that had gone to high school with him to play in the numbers game, to join in as a banker, not just running numbers. He was offered a banker's position. Mm -hmm. And explain to us that. So I'm going to stop you really quick. Explain to us what, what a banker's position is. It's just like being a vice president of a bank, a national bank. Mm -hmm. You are in charge. You are the person that's backing this operation. Okay, so we're just trying to get a little bit more information, right? For those that don't know what the numbers game is, give give us a little bit more insight on on that, so that we can get a clear understanding of what the numbers actually mean. Because we know well, today it's a lottery, but what was it? What did it well, mean back then? This is what it meant back then. They had several games, just as you see in the lottery today. There's several games. You had games that were called the bond. You had the total. You had the night house and you had the Cuba. Obviously, the Cuba hailed from Cuba by short wave radio. Um, and this, this particular game was done based on the horse races. The horse races came out of New York 
and they call it the aqueduct horse races. Then you had the bond. The bond was based on the banking system, okay, or the New York Stock Exchange. So they had several ways to determine what that number was. Mm -hmm. One game that was played was called the Night House. It's where they filled up a bag with 100 numbers in it. Balls were about mm, half inch in diameter, just like you see on today's lottery mm -hmm. game. And it, the bag is shaken, and then someone reaches in or cuts the bottom of the bag, and whatever ball falls out, that was the number. So if 35 was the number, mm -hmm. and, and you played and you gambled and you played 35, you won. Okay, so how but, was this? Was it only in your... Um, in Jacksonville, Florida, or was it? Oh, no, no, no. This game was played worldwide. Yeah. New York um, was a hotbed for Bolita. Mm -hmm. Florida just happened to be one of the states that was seriously a hotbed. Yeah. Jacksonville, Florida, Tampa, Florida, they would shut down a Bolita house, and another one would pop up within 38 hours. Yes, I, I know. It's, I know it's very big in Harlem. Uh, Harlem, you know, a lot of movies. Was. A lot of movies that you see right now, um, dealing with Madam Queen and some of those people and uh, Bumpy Johnson, some of those right. old school gangsters. Madam Saint Clair. Yeah, Madam yeah. Saint Clair. They were they were uh, running numbers, and it was very huge. Um, a lot of people refer to it as the poor man's lotto. Uh, and it is. It's like cheap insurance. But what people didn't understand was if you played $1, it was $65 to the dollar. Wow. If you played a dollar, wow. you made $65. Wow. Back in 1961, that was, that was decent money. Right. Yes. So is it kind of like the Harlem Nights? Just like the Harlem Nights. All right. All right. I love that movie. Okay. Rhonda, tell me a little bit about uh, the law enforcement perspective from this. I'm all, I always come from the law enforcement, but what uh, what was their involvement in as all of this was uh, taking place? Well, you know, Jacksonville again is the deep south. Um, you had people on the tape, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, people like to get their gre hands uh, greased and. That is what had to happen in order for them to facilitate their operation. Hmm. So, you know, they did what they had to do. So what's the difference then in someone back then doing what they had to do versus the modern day person that just says, I'm doing what I have to do? Do you think that it was more acceptable back then than it is today? I think it was. I think it was more acceptable because it was more, it was a business. This was real. Okay. This was not gun slanging, you know, fist fights. This was an actual business. My mm. father had people on the payroll mm. that actually worked for him and they got paid on Saturday, just like someone going to a normal job. Okay. So what inspired you to write your dad's story? Well, at about 10 years old, my father made a statement. We were just doing laundry, just, you know, hanging out at the house. And my father had gone through several cases, several federal cases, because the charge is called racketeering or wagering of taxes, and it is a federal crime. And once his last case was over, he said, you know, one day I think I'll write a book. And he just never got that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So living in his, in his dreams, you, you kind of. Right. And I wanted to choose. tell his story mm -hmm. from his perspective, from the way that I saw things happening as a child. Okay. So at 10 years old, at what age would you say that it stopped? Like that he, he stopped running numbers because you were 10 when you really remember it so around what oh, age i was like four years old when i remember oh, wow. <laughs> my daddy did not stop running numbers until the day he died which was august 24th 1983 he wow. was still selling numbers 
even though the, wow. the modern day lottery was active at that point. No, I, in Florida, the modern day lottery did not become legal okay. until 1988. Oh, wow. Wow. Because wow. okay. hmm. hmm. when you, uh, you said 1983 is when he stopped? Yes, when he died. And, yes. And, uh, so, I, but I, other states had already legalized it by that time. Right. So. We, Florida was a little slow um, getting started with the lottery. And what they did is they made promises to the residents of Florida that they would use um, some of the, I guess, residual monies from the lottery for education. So that was the push. And that's how they got the residents of Florida to accept the lottery. Yeah. Ron, uh, Ron, let me ask you this too. Um, it was a lot of mafia ties with Bolita all it over was. the nation. Did your father run into some of the Italians who were very heavy in Bolita? Italians, I believe, the Russians, also, um, um, I believe the Jamaicans, especially down there in Florida with where you are. Did he well, run into let, let me explain something. One of the things about running Bolita in Jacksonville, it was territorial. Okay. okay. So you stayed on your side of town. I'll stay on my side of town. If I need something from you, we'll contact you. So it sounds like it was a gang, almost like a gang affiliation, because when I hear you say certain things, um, that's kind of how the gangs are now. So what would happen if the territories in a sense, cross paths, or were you were you privy to that information? I wasn't privy to that information, but one thing I do remember is everybody respected everybody's territory, okay. you know. Um, but you did have to go sometimes and ask for assistance. Let's just say someone had a really big hit out on numbers, and there were people that will call the layoff man, and sometimes you would have to go to someone and say, okay. I had a hit out for like 80 grand and I just don't quite have that type of cash flow right now. So I may have to borrow something from the layoff man. That puts you into another territory. But these gentlemen, as I keep saying, were respectable gentlemen. So they honored each other. And if mm -hmm. someone needed something from someone else, they were able to get it. All right, so talk a little bit about your book, your actual book though. My, my book starts from birth to my father's death. It goes over the multiple trials that he had. My father had uh, actually three charges against him. Uh, the first charge was a charge of perjury hmm. because of the people that he was associated with. They were arrested. And as I said, this is a federal crime mm -hmm. and it's called wagering taxes. Okay, and basically you're not paying money on gambling, you know, right. income. So my basically we say, you know how we say, he wouldn't roll over and he wouldn't tell. Right. So right. basically what they did was they gave him an opportunity to tell or admit that he was a part of the numbers game. Uh -huh. And he did neither. So that made him get a charge of perjury. Hmm. So once he caught the charge of perjury, he had to get an attorney. And a case like this, what you do is you go out and get the best of the best to represent right. you. And that's what he did. Um, he got one of the attorneys that had worked with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Wow. And uh, he was able to work that charge. My father actually never took the stand. This wow. attorney was just that good. Wow. The judge basically said that the case was not worthy of the American justice system. Wow. And he thought that the jury, he instructed the jury to acquit this man and do it quickly. They came back. He was acquitted. He wow. went home. You, you know, wow. as, I, as I listen to your story, Ron, I'm going to say two things. Your father was a Don or a boss. <laughs> <laughs> first of all he getting high price lawyers and all everything and then also for him to last that long in that game right. your dad had pull and connection he he did and my father was well liked mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and he was well respected one of the things that 
I have taken from my father from childhood to adulthood is he loved the Lord. And one of the main things that he said to me, he says, Rhonda, always treat people the way you want to be treated. Yes. So Rhonda, with, you know, kind of with that being said, and, and he was able to, uh, uh, you know, get off on, be acquitted for the charges. Was there ever any fear or uh, did you all ever feel like there was tension or that someone would come after you? How, how, how was the feeling in the home? I never felt threatened. Yeah. I, I just never did. You know, my father did what he did. Um, well respected and we we never yeah. had any problems. Wonderful. Now see I always deal with people from like the emotional side of things, right? And the mental side and and how did that grow like with your friends or like were your friends' parents also part of this running numbers or the Belita group? Or how were you looked at differently? Or did you even feel that there was a difference or did you just you really did not you knew, but you didn't know the full dangers of what was really going on and how I, that impacted I, you today. I didn't know. I knew, but I didn't know. I, now, I do remember as a, as a small child, one of the neighbors treating me kind of funny, but, you know, it, I went home and I told my parents and they were like, just don't go over there and play with the kids anymore, you know, and that was it. You know? So you, your childhood was just like normal. But my childhood you- was normal, as normal as... It was wonderful. I mean, I was in the church choir. <laughs> you know, I was an usher at church. I mean, it was normal. Okay. Yeah. And so it really has no effect on you growing. Like, how, what are your thoughts today about your what your dad did and who he was? And did he also make a difference in the community? Because you said he was well-liked, well-respected. But did he really make a, a difference, especially at that time in the community? I think he did because, no, he didn't build a sports arena. But if you came to Frank and said, Frank, I can't pay my mortgage. Frank, I'm about to lose my car. Mm -hmm. Frank would reach his hand in his pocket and give you what you needed. Mm -hmm. If you needed groceries, you know, that's giving back. And I mean, that's a direct give back. You know, he had no problems because the east side of Jacksonville is where he grew up. And this is where he was running numbers and he had his operation. So you're going to go back and you're going to take care of the people in the community that you came out of. Mm-hmm. Who would your dad have been today? Say that again. I'm sorry. Who would your dad have been today with the numbers not being like, what type of person would he have been? Today? He probably would have, he had such an, what I say, an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm-hmm. My father probably would be doing community development or something of that nature. Mm. And uh, Rhonda, I was thinking, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, doing the Belita, it really helped families. It helped the community, you know. There... It did. I mean, you did not have people on welfare like you right. have on welfare today. You know, you've got that 86-year-old lady that is refusing to take commodities because that's what they gave people back in the early 60s. They didn't get food stamps. Mm. They got commodities. They got a silver can with a black cow on it, okay, Mm. in its own juices and powdered eggs. So people didn't want that. So they sold numbers. They wrote numbers. Wow. What do you think about today's lottery? Uh, I know it's supposed to be that the lottery gives back to the educational system. And to, what do you think of it today? I think that it is not doing what it could do. Because in Florida, they are giving it to Bright Futures scholarships for people going to college. But in order to get a Bright Futures scholarship, you've got to have a 2.0, uh, excuse me, a 3.0 average. Um, there are not a lot of children or kids coming out of school with a 3.0 when we've got failing schools here in Jacksonville, Florida. Mm-hmm. I mean, my, myself, I didn't have a 3.0, right. but yeah. I, I went to college and I graduated. So what are you doing today um, to keep your dad's legacy going, like who he was outside of just being nice, right? Because a lot of us are just nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but what are you doing outside of, of that to 
keep his name going and, and like share with us about that? I'm just sharing the book and the things that he taught me, you know, are so, are so valuable. You know, the lessons that he taught me, Rhonda, always be kind. Rhonda, always be a lady. Rhonda, always speak correctly. You know, and just, I instilled all of that in my daughter. I always tell people, get a good education, a foundation. My father said, one of the things that they can't take away from you is the degree that you've got. You'll always have that. And he believed that education is key. Mm -hmm. uh, I read everything I get my hands on. My daughter reads everything she gets her hands on. And knowledge is power. Okay. And are you impacting yes. your community now? I am. I, I'm, I'm working in the community. I have done a lot of work in East Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I followed some of his tradition in working in community development. Um, mm -hmm. I have a de de uh, background in community development and building houses in neighborhoods that are filled with slum and blight. And we have done a lot of infill housing in East Jacksonville, trying to better that neighborhood over the years. And of course, now, as I said earlier, I work for a nonprofit organization, probably one of the better nonprofit agencies in Jacksonville. And we are working with low to moderate income people. Okay. Uh, Rhonda, you know, coming from a writer's perspective, I've written a book and I uh, have experienced uh, writer's block. And I was wondering that uh, when you were writing this, did you experience either writer's block or even an emotional writer's block? Um, because this, this was, you know, matters of the heart. You were speaking, Correct. you know, about your father. Was there any writer's block or were you able to flow, you know, with, you know, what you had inside? I was able to just write and continue to write. Wow. But I did have moments when I would just literally get up and cry because I couldn't just reach out and say, Daddy, you know. Yes. That was the emotional part for me. I think just remembering things and then not being able to, to talk to him. But right. I never got writer's block. It just flowed. It was like he was there right with me. Just just keep on going. I mean, my father used to say, sugar, you're doing a good job. And I kept saying, I want to do this for him. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Very nice. That's amazing. So and so and so is there a is there a possibly a movie? Um, oh wow. <laughs> about um, I have been approached. Let's just just okay. let's just say I've been approached. Okay, good. So, so keep me in mind because <laughs> I can tell you your father. I'm telling you, I can walk around. Tell me some characteristics about your father. Four, four characteristics that you can give us about your father. Uh, let's see. Six foot two. Oh, that's me. <laughs> 210 okay. pounds. I can lose some weight. <laughs> uh, gotta get some hair. Um, oh, kind of okay, salt that's... and pepper gray hair. Um, yeah. And do you have a 1968 Mercedes? Two oh, I, I can rent one. <laughs> <laughs> he rent was one. definitely the definition of a gentleman. He was. Yes. No, I, I, but you do fit. You do the fit. The classic man. He, he, he does fit a character that worked for my father. Wow. He does. Wow. I, I don't like what you said. You said character. <laughs> and no, and they worked for. No, he, he was a great guy. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's so awesome. I think he would be, your father would be very proud of the story that you, you're presenting and um, awesome. I cannot wait to read it and I cannot okay. wait, you know, when you do uh, put forth that movie, I think it's going to be wonderful. It's really going to uh, give light to, to the Belita for people who don't know, you know, what that is. And that, that it's don't be interesting. know every day when they go to the nearest convenience store or grocery store, the gambling. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it's just legal right now, you know, it's but to legal. me, like when I, when I think about what wasn't legal and what's legal today, right, I think about what's current now. So we know that with marijuana, everybody was selling on the streets. People are locked up and they got life for it. And yeah. today, you know, they're trying to pass a law that is making it's this different. legal. 
they're trying to make it legal because the government now is coming and get, they're like, wait a minute, too many people are getting rich off of this. Let me go ahead and get some extra money and make it legal where now everybody has access to it. So it's like, do you know anyone that is still currently locked up that was running numbers? Oh, no, 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 no. One of the, like I said, this was a federal crime. And for crimes like this, you got 18 months. You know, you got to remember, these guys had money. They could get the best attorneys in the city, the state. Right. right. So they got 11 months, 18 months, and they were home, and they still got the majority of what they had when they went in. Right, because they didn't really seize everything that they do probably today. Oh, you know? no, no, no. Yeah. So these wow. guys, these guys were good. So you were that girl that everybody hated because you had the nice shoes, you had the, <laughs> the nice clothes, right? You, <laughs> you know, that girl. So funny because that was the way it was, and I never really thought about it. Now, looking back 30 years, I was like, oh my goodness, I had everything. Right. Yeah. You know, but um, I wow. think it made me a very humble person and made me a very giving person, you know. Yeah. So, 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 so Rhonda was that, that little girl that when the other girls, her come Rhonda. <laughs> Here comes Rhonda. <laughs> what up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. But were any of your friends um, where their parents were also running numbers, but you were either friends or what we call today associates? um with them how was that friendship like was there ever any animosity um is so even you were well well respected in in the school even with the other kids who their parents were running numbers even if they didn't have as much more more than likely if their parents were running numbers their parents worked for my father okay (laughs) so i mean it was they were scared respectfully. Good. They were respectfully yeah. scared of you, pretty much. Probably. <laughs> they didn't mess with that girl. They didn't mess with that girl. <laughs> they played with me, though. <laughs> they was like, uh uh-uh, uh, we're going to just go over to her house and be nice. Let's just be nice <laughs> to her, y'all. Do y'all know who her daddy is? You know, mm-hmm. I'm quick to say that you don't know my daddy. You better know who my daddy is. <laughs> you know, I'm speaking about our Heavenly Father. So I know that you have a copy of your book, and I am definitely interested in seeing. It can you because you know for me right when I go and get a book from a bookstore or if I've never heard about it the first thing I do is go to the back of the book or I go to the very first page because I want to know give me a little bit of meat about your book right let's get our listeners interested in wanting to go out and definitely get this number I mean the number the book uh oh right <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, can show you, um, I can show you a picture real quick yes. okay, of the cover of the book. And uh, like I said, it's called Numbers 35 and 53, The Case of the Brown Paper Bag. The cover was actually done by a very, very talented artist by the name of Gerald Williard, um, who I became friends with because he was a veteran. And um, he's just so talented. And he was able to just sit down and bring out the heart of what I wanted on the cover of the book and if you see the book cover you'll notice that my father is in a brown paper bag he's in a brown paper bag for a reason what does that mean he is actually in a brown paper bag and he put the photo in a in a bag because what people said was numbers runners always carry brown paper bag because a brown paper bag was the hallmark of the numbers game so if you're seen going from tavern to tavern to pool wall and you're carrying a brown paper bag, you must be selling numbers or running Bolita. Hmm. So how do you know how one would have gotten into it? Like, let's say Bolita was running today, right? Forget the lottery. Bolita wasn't running. You were in your dad's position. How would I come up to you if I saw that brown paper bag and say, I want to be, I want to be within the numbers or, or what was the lingo at that time? There was, this was close knit. You just didn't walk up and, and, okay. and do that. You know, you were sending word through somebody else that sent word to the banker. You just didn't walk up to the banker and, you know, right. say, Hey, I want to work for you. Uh, no, it didn't work that way. Hmm. 
you know, and one of the things, it was a trust issue. And just like now, you can't trust everybody. Right. You know, the Bible tells you what? Can't put all your trust in man because he will what? Forsake you. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. So, most of the people that worked for my father, they were what we call East Siders, or it was an East Side thing, is what they called it. And they went to high school with him, or they played together as children, and they were people that he trusted. Okay. Yeah. So give and us a little bit. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mario. To walk up on someone at that time that was uh, running numbers probably indicated that you were law enforcement. In some cases, could get you handled, if I'm not mistaken. This is true. This is true. Uh, by, handle, by handle, I mean like capped. Yeah, there you but, go. But, uh, the thing about it is, the East Side community was such a close knit community. Okay. You knew what not to do. Okay. And and go ahead and read to us a little. Uh, you know, the back of the book, or like where your meat is in the book. Give us a well, little bit of. Well, what, what the back of the book tells you is Rhonda is telling you her epic story and it is the unvarnished truth. Basically, I hid nothing. I told everything. Well, give me some I, meat. I need some meat because you're, you're giving me the vegetables. I have my appetizer. <laughs> I got a little yeah. bit of dessert. But I'm missing my meat. I'm a meat type of girl. My daddy was a ladies' man. Go oh. ahead. That's what, I want. That's what we want. Oh. <laughs> My daddy was a ladies man. I'll tell you what my mother said. My mother said your daddy liked to squire the girls. Oh. <laughs> so give me that meat. That's what I'm talking about. I knew there was so something you, in it. She gave me the dessert, the vegetables. You know, I, <laughs> I want the meat of the story. So he he was a ladies man. I'm sure because he exactly. was quite popular as well, you know, and, and having the money and the the uh, prestige. Um, uh, yes. You know, yes. I tell one. I tell one story in the book where um, my father met his girlfriend at the mall and she gets out of her car and into my father's car and they go off to a hotel. The lady's husband called my mother and told my mother what happened. But he also said, but when my wife gets back to the mall, she won't be able to crank her car because I've taken the distributor cap off. So, wow. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> what did mama do? What did mama do? Okay, come on. You know what women do. Look, I, back, you suck know what? Back up. then, look, see, and me, I was just going to Look, I'm just going gonna, gonna to act a straight Lorena Bobbitt, you know. You, <laughs> you know I mean? I'm just going to say it, and I'm going to chop it up, and I'm going to run over it so it's not going to be able to put back on. I'm just saying, women back then didn't do no, they right. did that. Right. So what did yeah. what did what did Mama do? Give me give me what Mom did. She just kind of she she dealt with it a little bit, but you know, rumor has it I didn't see her do it. But rumor has it is she showed up on her job and invited her outside. Oh. <laughs> you know, you gotta understand. My mother was right at six feet tall. Okay, so. uh Wow. Yeah. She's something else. She hand, in so other she words, could handle her own. In other words, she handled it. She handled that, y'all. She she did it. Wow. She she got that man right, huh? But you okay. should try that again. So, <laughs> so that, that that's your me, you know. <laughs> to say that. All right. So wanna tell us how we can purchase the book. Tell us, you know, where we can get the book, how people can connect with you on social media, give us a little bit more information. On Twitter, I am Bolita Princess 3 You can purchase my book on Amazon.com. You can look for me under Rhonda Baker Stansberry, or you can look for the book as numbers 35 and 53, The Case of the Brown Paper Bag. Okay, where did those numbers come from? Where did 35 and 53 right. come from? Oh, God, that's a great question. Those were my I'm, a, I'm about prime to play numbers. those tonight. <laughs> <laughs> those were my daddy's prime numbers. My father always played 35, but one of the things is when you're playing a number, you always back it up. So you're going to flip that number. Mm. Okay. So 35, 53. Hmm. Okay. It's kind of like boxing a number, you know? Right, mm -hmm. right. 
So how did you get so much information on your dad? Like to be able to write an entire book from his birth? Like, and, and also the second part of that question is how did your family, once you started to expose the dirty secrets, right, of the family history, how did the family react to you on that? Well, they, I did meet with some resistance from some of my family members, but I mean, that's just too bad, too sad. <laughs> this book was coming. Right. This, this was not about them. This was not even about me. This was about my daddy. Because he wanted to write the book. Right. Okay. And um, this is what I did. Uh, as far as getting information, um, I started writing based on what I could remember. Okay. Then I interviewed over 30 people that were still living. Um, in fact, one of the gentlemen that I interviewed left me in tears. I had never met this gentleman before. And he said, your father was so good to me. He said, Rhonda, I would not be the man I am today if it was not for him. And I literally had to leave the room, you know. Um, so the book was going to be the book, and I was going to write the book and publish the book no matter what. Okay. That's good. The Bolita. Yeah. The Bolita. So I call myself, you know, I call my father a kingpin. So now I'm known as the Bolita Princess. The Bolita. Okay, okay. Now is there going to be another book from the Bolita Princess? Oh, no, no, no. The Bolita, the story has been told okay. um, from beginning to end. And that is it for right now. Okay. How long did it take you to write this book? It took me two and a half years to write the book. You know, I laughed because I had engaged a, a publisher earlier. And when you're writing a book, everybody has their own ideas of how you should write your book. Mm -hmm. And she got so annoyed with me till she fired me. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> so yeah. I um, met with, um, I call her my Auntie Ruth. Um, Stafford and she had written a book and published it through Zulon and she told me she said Rhonda I think you should go with Zulon Press and I did and I published my book through Zulon. Okay and what advice do you give to other people who are in, you know want to write a book they want to tell their story they may not feel like anybody else would want to hear their story um, you know, what advice would you give to that person? If you have a goal and you got to have, that is your A, okay? I don't believe in doing a backup plan. I've got plan A and I'm going to work plan A to I work it to death till I get the success. You know, Will Smith said it best. He said, don't go to plan B because if you go to plan B, that takes the focus off of A. So with that being said, all I can tell someone is if you want to write a book, a play, music, just do it. Just do it. Success yeah. failure. The opportunity is there. Air and opportunity. That's the only thing that's between you. That's right. That's good. Mm -hmm. And and you have done it and you have done an awesome job. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Absolutely. Now, Ron, I wasn't playing about when that movie came out. I'm <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna me right now, right now. You, 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 you fit a character. You do fit a character. What does that mean? I don't know. That I'm kind of. He's a good guy. He was. I'm gonna be your daddy. <laughs> See, that's a whole nother conversation, y'all. <laughs> when it came out, I want to play your father in the movie. <laughs> right. He about to get in trouble. He about to get in trouble. Daddy gonna. Come down. Yeah. And boy, we're not yeah. going to hear from Mario again. But but on a, on a, on a serious note, your daddy sounds like a charismatic gentleman who was well respected by the community. Somebody that when he walked down the street, people paused, people respected him, and that's yeah. intriguing to me. Yeah, you know what? At times, and I know this is probably not a nice. You know, people annoyed me because they thought that. He knew everything about everything, you know, and they would call him, Frank, I'm getting ready to buy a car. What do you think? Frank, tell me, 
tell me your thoughts on this. And I'm like, God, you guys think he knows everything, but turns out he knew a whole lot. Yeah. He knew a whole yeah. lot. That's what it sounds powerful. like. That's very wow. powerful. So, Ron, I'm going to go ahead and have our listeners definitely, um, you're going to give them your information one more time. You know, how would they purchase it on Amazon? How can they get your book? How can they contact you? And um, if they have any questions or anything like that, give us that information once again. Okay. My book can be purchased on Amazon.com. And you can look it up under Rhonda Baker Stansberry or by its title, Numbers 35 and 53, The Case of the Brown Paper Bag. And I can be contacted on Twitter. I am Bolita Princess 3. Awesome, awesome. Awesome. Christina, do you have any final thoughts? Oh, it was just so wonderful to uh, to meet you. I cannot Thank wait you. to read the book. Uh, yes, congratulations from Thank author you. to author. <laughs> Fabulous job. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate it. This was a wonderful opportunity. Absolutely. And Mario, any closing thoughts? Well, my closing thoughts, uh, when, when you, the Belita and the things you described, this book, actually puts me in the mind of, uh, you know, books, I mean, a movie such as Goodfellas and mm -hmm. things like that. And so I'm, I'm very intrigued and I'm very interested. And I, I can't wait, wait, to, wait to read the book also. Okay. Sounds like a winner. Absolutely. And of course, guys, um, my final thoughts are, Rhonda, you've just been such a beautiful blessing, you know, to us to be able to share your father's story. You know, I lost my dad and I don't know if I can tell his story. You know, his story would go a lot different. Than <laughs> he was well-respected and he was, I think my father was more feared. You know, even my stepfather, um, who was a Black Panther and still is. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my family is more feared, you know, than I would say respected. People, they knew not to mess with him, right? Um, okay. But I, I definitely thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for allowing me. Absolutely. And if guys, don't forget to uh, join us with Rhonda on Thanksgiving Day as she shares more information about her story. Also, don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and of course, Instagram at Coaching by the Word. Also, tune in daily to our podcast on anchor.fm, Life Coach Shay Owens, as we continue our journey in seeking a little R&R. &R. If you're looking to book me at your next event, seminar, and conference, or speaking, um, seeking individual, couple, or group coaching sessions, please feel free to visit my website, www.coachingbtw.com. As always, I'm giving honor to the Almighty Father God. Stay blessed, humbled, and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you in all that you do.